Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam wa ala Sayyid al-Musaleen Amma abad fa a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillahir Rahman Rahim As salatu wa salam wa alayka ya Rasulullah Wa ala alika wa sahabika ya Habib Allah As salatu wa salam wa alayka ya Nabi Allah Wa ala alika wa sahabika ya Nur Allah we begin by giving you blessings of reciting Durud Park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam is reported to have said that the person that will be closest to me on the day of judgment will be the one that sent Durud Park upon me the most. Sallu alal Habib. So try and make a habit. I know it's, you're all a little bit tired, but our jazba, our enthusiasm when it comes to sending salutations upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Wasallam, we should never waver. No matter how tired you are, you should always be sending through the park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallu alal Habib. <clears throat> I've got a story that I want to share with you. Some of you may have heard this story before. It was written by a brother. And when you listen to the story, you will realize that in each and every one of us, there may be some part of us that relates to that story. I'm going to change the names so that the names that were in the original story are not there. And inshallah, when we get to the end of the story, you'll understand what I'm trying to say to you. In a street in the north, not very far from here, two children were born. They were born a few months apart in the same street. And obviously they were young ch children, they were babies, they were toddlers, they didn't know each other. Their parents didn't even know each other. But what happened was obviously when they got to the age that they were going to the nursery and the school, then obviously the parents met, the mothers met each other. And as a result, the mothers met each other, the children met each other, and this friendship started to develop. And what would happen was one day, the mother would say, I will pick them up. The mother said, I'll pick them up. And it came to the point that during the lunch breaks, they were eating together, they were playing together, they would go to each other's house and play and eat and so on. And this friendship developed. This friendship developed and they carried on through primary school and they carried on through primary school. And then when the time came to choose the secondary school, they both insisted that we want to go to the school that my friend goes to. Yeah, they both said to the parents, we don't care which school we're going to, as long as I go to the school that my friend is going to. So they went to the same school. They convinced the parents, whatever the school was, good, bad, or ugly, they decided to go to the school. Now, in the first year of that school, everything was fine. Everything was the same as at primary school. They were very close with each other. They were very friendly with each other. But halfway through the second year, you know, halfway through the second year, an elder lad in his final year came and started talking to these lads. And these two lads were called Ayan and Khaled. Now they started to talk to Ayan and Khaled, both of them. And what happened was, he offered them a cigarette. He offered them, them a cigarette, and both of the children said, no, I'm not, I'm not having this cigarette, you know. And they realized that cigarettes were wrong because of the way that they've been brought up, the households that they've been brought up. And as a young age, people are scared of cigarettes. So both Ayan and Khaled refused these cigarettes. A few days later, that same lad approached them. Now this time he approached them with a different tactic. He started to put peer pressure on top of them. And started to say to them, are you still a baby? Are you still your mummy's boy? Are you always going to hold on to your mummy's clothes? Are you never going to get this freedom? Are you, are you so weak that you, you can't live like a, a big man? Is that what you're like? Now this peer pressure slowly, slowly started to take effect. And one day when he came and he offered again these cigarettes, this time, Khaled succumbed. He took the cigarette. Even though Ayan said to him, don't take the cigarette, don't take the cigarette, it's wrong. He said, no, no, it's okay, it's only one cigarette. What is it? It's only one cigarette. I'm just going to have a few puffs. He took a few puffs of the cigarette. He coughed a little bit, but he felt like the man now. He felt like the boy now, he felt like he was strong, he felt like he was with the big boys. And what he did is from that moment on, these two people, these two childhood friends, the past started to differ. Because Khaled wanted to hang out with the big boys. He wanted to be with the tough lads. He wanted to see be with them and he wanted to do what they were doing. Whereas Ayan, he didn't, he realized that this was wrong. And so gradually, the paths went further and further apart. They started to have different friends. They started to hang out at different places. And it came to the point where weeks and months would go by where they would never really see each other. Fast forward 10 years. They're in the early 20s. It's a Thursday night. And a yarn gets up in the morning. It's 3.15 in the morning. He gets up. He goes to the washroom to perform wudu. 
because he's going for the Jamaat, he's going to go to the masjid, and he gets up early because Jamaat's about four o'clock, it's the middle of the night. So he gets up, performs the wuzu, before he leaves to go to the masjid, he reads a little bit of Quran and goes to the masjid. So as Ayan is going out of his house, Khalid is coming in his house. He's been on the town with his friends, he's been on the town with the lads, he's been enjoying himself. He's tanked up, he's fully intoxicated with alcohol inside him, and as he walks through this door, his mother is sitting in the front room crying. Bitter, where have you been? I've been waiting up for you all night. I've been ringing you. I've rang you 20 times. I've sent you so many messages. WhatsApp messages, calls. You never answered my calls. Mum, leave me alone. You know, my head's are now. Just let me go to bed. Stop giving me grief. He's shouting at his mother that, why are you giving me so much grief? I'm a grown man now. I can do what I want. Who are you to tell me what to do? And he storms up the stairs and his mum says to him, do you want any food? No, I don't want any food. Leave me alone. And he goes to the top of the stairs and he gets in his bed. Fast forward a few hours later. Ayan gets up, it's the day of Jummah. He goes to the bathroom. He performs ghusl, according to the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He cuts his nails, trims his beard, trims his mustache, puts the oil on him, puts the itar on him, gets himself ready, puts the Imam Sharif on. And as usual, like every Friday, he gets to the masjid early. Why? Because he wants to be in the front row. He wants to listen to what the Imam has to say. He wants to learn from him. And he knows the blessings of the front row. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said that if the companions knew the blessings that you could attain in the front row, then you would fight over it. You would draw lots over it. That's how much blessings are in the front row. So he wants to be in the front row. He doesn't want to fight, obviously, but he wants to be in the front row. He wants to get the blessings of being in the masjid as early as possible. So he gets there as early as possible. Meanwhile, in Khalid Bai's house, they're having to drag him out of bed. You know, it's a once a week affair that he goes to masjid, but he doesn't like going. They drag him out to bed, he goes to the bathroom and he has a shower. Now, those of you that have been listening will realize I use the word ghusl for a yarn and I use the word shower for Khalid. And there's a complete difference. There's a complete difference if only we understand. And just for the benefit of this gathering, I'm going to mention to you very, very quickly the three faraiz of ghusl. Because unfortunately, many Muslims have lived their whole life and they never performed the ghusl properly. And ghusl, if it becomes furs upon you and you do not perform the ghusl properly, then your namaz is not valid, your talawat is not valid, any of your badat is not valid. The three faraiz of ghusl. Number one, Getting water in the back of your throat and making sure all of your throat gets wet. It's not as simple as getting under the shower, getting on the water and standing there and turning up the temperature until it gets nice and warm and you get a relaxing neck back massage with the hot water. That's not a ghusl. So now you've, got, you've done the kuli, you've, you've got the water to the back of your throat, you've got all of your mouth wet. And I would advise you, just as a practical bit of advice, use cold water with that. The reason why I say this is when you use cold water, you can feel where the water's gone. You know, because your mouth is warm, when you use water, water, you're not sure where the water's gone. So if you use cold water, it gets everywhere and you can feel that it's got everywhere. So that's the first photos. The second photos is sniffing water, getting it up to the soft bone. When you do this, you'll feel it. You'll like, you twinge a little bit when the water gets up there. But this is again the second photos. You must get water, you must get this wet. This place needs to get wet. And the third one may seem simple, is to make sure every part of the body gets wet. Now you see that's simple, stand under the shower, easy. But if you just stand under the shower like I'm standing now, there's a good chance that under my arms don't get wet. In between my legs don't get wet. Between my backsides they don't get wet. There's certain parts where you've got folds. And if you've got a big stomach, then there's parts of your stomach that won't get wet as well. So you need to be very careful and make sure every part of your body gets wet. Inside your ears, all that, because if you stand under the shower, sometimes the water doesn't go inside your ears. These are all the precautions that you need to make. And inshallah, if you carry on traveling in these spiritual treats and these kafalas, you'll learn all these things. So coming back to our story, Halad, they just had a shower. He stands under the shower, has a quick shower, comes out, has a quick shave, puts some aftershave on, gets his clothes on, checks that his phone battery is charged, and he goes to the masjid. But where does he go? Right to the back. Because that's where his mates are. That's where all his mates are. They're all sitting at the back there. And they're not listening to what the Imam Sahib is saying. They're messaging each other. They're planning what they're going to do tonight. Because there's a new nightclub opened up in a new town, and they want to go there. What time should we meet up? Who's coming with us? Are them girls coming with us? Where are we going to get the drinks from? Where are we going to get the pot from? What are we going to do? And the message each other, they're not listening to what the Imam Sahib is saying. They don't want to be here, but they're forced to be here. So they're messaging each other, making this plan. Jummah takes place. And normally, Ayan, after the namaz, he stays behind and performs the sunnah and stays to the end and does the Salat of Salam. But this time, he gets up early. As soon as he does the Salam, he gets up and he goes to the door. Why? Because today, there's going to be a spiritual retreat. There's going to be a Madri Kafla, and he wants to invite all of these people. So he's standing at the door, inviting people, talking to them, and convincing them to come with them to the masjid tonight. They're going to a different town. They're going to this different town where there's a new masjid, and they want to go there as well. 
And after a long time, these two old friends meet each other. They've not met each other in a long time, because Khalid, he gets out of the masjid as soon as possible. Ayan normally stays there late, and one's at the front and one's at the back, so they very rarely meet each other. But today they meet each other. And today he talks to him and says, come, come to the masjid, we're going to be doing this, we're going to be doing that. And the standard excuses, if you've ever tried to invite people on one of these things, they make all these, oh, I'm busy, I'll try, I'll see, where's it going to be, let me know, what's happening, where it's going to be, I'll try and get there. But you know that they're not, they're not really making a firm intention, they don't really want to come. So he says, yeah, yeah, I'll see, I'll see. So Khalid leaves, he has no intention of going to the kafla, he's got no intention of going to the masjid. Right? But he just wanted to get rid of his old friend. Fast forward a few hours now, it's now five, six o'clock in the evening. And in the Yarn's house, he's getting ready to go to the masjid. And he's got his bags and he's got his clothes and he's got all his things together. And as he's leaving, his mother says to him, Beta, I was given these dates from Medina. I was given these dates from Medina, please eat these dates before you go and do dua for me. Now Ayan says to his mother, mother, please give me permission to take these dates with me. Rather than eating them here, give me permission to take them to the masjid and I'll share them with the people that are there. Even though we all have a little bit, we'll share them with them. And his mother gives permission. And as his mother gives permission, the son kisses the hands, Ayan kisses the hands of his mother and leaves the house. And as Ayan is leaving the house, mother starts crying. Now her tears are of happiness because she's thinking to herself, Allah has blessed me. How fortunate I am that I have a son that respects me, I have a son that loves me, a son that travels in the way of Allah I've not done anything to achieve this. Allah has blessed me. And she's thanking her Rabb. But my Rabb, I've, I've not done anything. You have blessed me with such a beautiful son. Meanwhile, in Khalabai's house, he's also getting ready to go out. And he needs to leave early because they're meeting the friends and they're going to a different town to go to this nightclub. And they plan on getting there early, chilling around the town, having something to eat before they go to the nightclub. And when he's leaving, his mother's saying to him, where are you going? Why should I tell you? What time are you going to be back? When I'm back. Are you going to have something to eat? No, I'm not having that packy food. I'm not going to eat that rubbish. I'm going to have a, go and have a burger. I'm going to have proper food. And he doesn't listen to a single word that his mother says, and he leaves his house. And as he's leaving his house, his mother's also crying. But there's a difference between the tears of Ayan's mother and Khala's mother. Khala's mother's thinking to herself, what have I done wrong? She's blaming herself. I have done something wrong here. I have done something wrong. What have I done wrong? There's something I've done wrong. And she's blaming herself that she is the reason that her son has been like this. That my son doesn't listen to me. My son doesn't do anything. Only once a week I force him to go to the masjid and even that's a struggle. What have I done wrong? Allah. She's shedding these tears. A few hours later, Ayan and the brothers, they've offloaded all of the stuff into the masjid. And they decide to go out and walk on the streets and meet the Muslims and invite them to a gathering. Invite them to the gathering so that we're going to be here this weekend. And you come to the gathering, inshallah, when you come here, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. Like this weekend, you're going to be talking about addiction, you're going to be talking about so many things. They're telling the brothers that, look, come, you're going to benefit from this. Inshallah, there'll be food provided, it'll be good food, it'll be only just Korean salad, there'll be burgers and pizzas and everything. So come to the masjid, inshallah, and they're trying to convince these people. Okay? Meanwhile, Khalid, he's picked up his mates, they've got the girls in the back of the car, They've been to the wine shop, they've got the cans of beer in the car, they've got some pot, they're smoking that and they're driving around the town and chilling. Now on one street corner, Ayan and the brothers are talking. They're talking to some brothers. And as they're talking, a car comes around the corner at full speed. And as it comes around the corner at full speed, the, the wheels screech, the brakes go on, and everybody jumps out of the way, but the car hits Ayan. And he's crushed against a tree. The driver of the car was Khalid and he's come straight through the windscreen. He's come straight through the windscreen, why? Because he wasn't wearing his seat belt. They're both taken to the hospital. They're both in ICU. In Ayan by his ward, all the brothers are there and they're messaging everybody all around the country. Ayan is ill, Ayan has had an accident, please do dua for him. And all these people are doing dua and they're getting messages that we're sitting together, we're reciting Surah Yasin, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing these duas and all these duas are taking place. Because the doctor has said this is serious. Meanwhile in Khalibai's room, it's also serious. But his friends are looking at each other, thinking, what have we done? What are we going to do? The police are going to come soon because we've got alcohol in our bloodstream. We've had drugs and they scarper. They leave because they don't want to be there when the police come. A few hours later, Ayan opens his eyes. And when he opens his eyes, he says, As-salatu was salamu alayka ya Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. And all the brothers are so happy that Ayan has read through the park, he's read through the park and they start sending messages to everybody. Ayan's opened his eyes, he's read through the park. Inshallah, he's going to be okay. 
but then he closes his eyes. And when he closes his eyes, the doctor comes in and says, this is serious. He's opened his eyes, he's read through the part, but he's still very, very critical. Meanwhile, in Khalabai's room, he opens his eyes. Now he's got a stomach full of alcohol, he's got drugs inside his blood, and he doesn't know where he is, he's scared, he's worried. He looks around, there's nobody there. And he's screaming and he's swearing. And all of this foul mouth is coming out of his mouth because that's his normal, that's how he lived his life. He's always been effing and blinding. So he's swearing now. And as he's swearing, all of a sudden his eyes close again as well. And the doctor realizes that he's also critical as well. A few hours later, Ayan opens his eyes and he reads the kalma and closes his eyes for the last time. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. And messages go around the, the country that a Yambai has passed away. Less preparations for the ghusl. Inshallah, namaz e janazah will take place at Fazana Medina at this time, at this time, at this time. And all these preparations are going into place. Meanwhile, in Khalabai's ward, he opens his eyes. He's screaming, he's effing, he's blinding, he's in so much pain. But he also closes his eyes for the last time. He's not fortunate enough to receive the, recite the kalma. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun. The next day, at the local Fazana Medina. Ayan's body is brought, and the brothers from Dawud Islami come and they perform the ghusl. And when they perform the ghusl, they come out and they say to the brothers, you know what, Ayan looked as if he'd just gone asleep. You know, he even like Noor was on his face, he had a smile on his face, he looked so beautiful. You know, I, I couldn't believe that he'd gone, he looked so comfortable. You know, I just thought he's going to open his eyes and he's going to start talking to us and, and guiding us and telling us and doing infradi koshish on his like he's always done. And they said he just looks so comfortable, so peaceful. And all the people from all around the country turn up at the namaz janaza And at the namaz janaza people are saying, you know what, Ayan was such a really nice person. He was so kind, he was so gentle, he worked for the deen, his mother loved him, his father loved him. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when a person passes away, if people speak good about that person, then Jannat is wajib for that person. Now before I go any further, I want you to ask yourself, if you were to pass away today, what would your friends, your relatives, your colleagues, your partner, your kids, what would they say about you? Something for us to ponder on. So the namaz janaza takes place and all of the brothers, the majority of the brothers, go to the graveyard. He's buried there and about eight or ten brothers stay behind for many hours and they're reciting North Street at the grave. Now when it comes to Khalid, by his body's not been released. They decide to do an autopsy because they found blood they found alcohol in the bloodstream. They found drugs inside his body and this whole autopsy takes place and his body is eventually released two weeks later. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the results of an autopsy. I had a personal experience once that I went and did the ghusl of someone that had an autopsy. He was cut from here to here. He was cut from here to here. He was cut from here to here. And I don't know why, but he's cut from the groin to the back of the knee. And when he was sewn up, he was sewn up like with rope. And blood and pus were oozing out of the wounds. That is the state of the body after an autopsy. We should all do dua that Ya Allah protect us from ever, us or all our families or all our loved ones ever having an autopsy. So when the ghusl takes place, because it's in the same masjid, because they were brought up in the same area, it's the same brothers that are performing the ghusl. And when these brothers come out after performing the ghusl, they don't say anything. They remain silent. They don't, like previously they were saying how comfortable he was, they remain silent, they didn't say anything. When the namaz janaza takes place, his so-called friends, and I say so-called friends turned up at the namaz janaza but like all times, they're right at the back. And they're looking at each other saying, how do we do this? How do we perform namaz janaza Why are the sifs so close to each other? You know, you'll be surprised, brothers, that I have personally been to namaz janazas where next to me a person has stood there and he's close to 30 years of age, and he said to me that there's no room here to do sajda. How can we perform the namaz janaza A 30-year-old Muslim does not know that there's no sajda in namaz janaza So they don't know what's happening here. So they copy the people in front of them. So they put their hands there, and, and then they wait for the salam, and then they scarper. They're gone. Why? Because they're planning for tonight. They forgot about him. Khalid's gone, he's forgotten. And when they go to the graveyard, very, very few brothers are there. None of his so-called friends are there. None of the people that he knew are there. And he's buried. And he's in that dark and lonely grave. Now brothers, this, you could say that this is just 
a story. But if we look around us, how many people are affected by this? And I remember many, many years, I related this story many, many years ago. I related this story to one brother, and he said to me, his words were, it's funny, but today, and that was New Year's Eve as well, but today, in my house, me and my brother both had a shower. I've come to the masjid, my brother's gone on to the town. Same house, two brothers, it happens. That when they're the same household, two brothers, one can come to the masjid, and one could be going out on the town and chilling and enjoying themselves. So brothers, our life is a journey. And we all gonna end up at the same place. I, we're all going to die. Everybody's going to pass away. This is a fact. Your time is written. Both of these people passed away at the same place. Both of these people died in a road accident because that was their destiny. But both of them had different deaths. And you, need to make that choice of that, how am I planning my life? You've made that choice, you've come here. And throughout your life, you'll have these choices. And peer pressure is one thing that we mentioned in that story, that peer pressure affects our youngsters. Not just affects our youngsters, it affects our elders as well. You may think that I'm 50 years of age now, I'm not gonna be affected by peer pressure. Whatever stage of your life you are in, you can be affected by peer pressure. Your friends or your so-called friends can convince you to do whatever they want you to do. I remember we went, we went on a Madhuri Kafla once, and during part of the Madhuri Kafla was to go out and invite people to the masjid for the beyond that was going to take place at Maghrib. And we went into this park area and there was all these lads there and they had dogs and they had chains, you know, on the dogs, they had the big bulldogs and they all had the string vests and their chains around them and the earrings on them and everything. And I looked at my Negran and I said, you know what, I don't think we're going to get much here. You know, we're wasting our time. He said, no, no, I'll about try, 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 talk to them. I said, okay. So we talked to them. And one person, when we said come to the masjid, one person said I would come. And when he said he would come, everybody laughed at him. What are you doing? He said, well, I've got nothing else better to do. I might as well go there. And the mosque is near my home. I'll drop off at the mosque and then I'll go home. And they laughed at him. But he had the courage to walk away from that place. And my Negrani said to me, you stand at the front with him. You talk with him. Yeah. You stay with him. Talk to him. Don't leave him. Make sure he goes to the masjid. So as we were walking to the masjid, he says to me, brother, this is not me. And I said to him, have I said anything about your clothes? He said, no, but I'm telling you, this is not me. I said, why do you say that? He said, if I do not dress like this, if I do not have this earring, if I do not have this gold chain, if I don't have my hair like this and this, I will have zero friends. And I feel that I have to be like this to have these friends. If I'm not like this, I don't have any friends. Isn't that scary? Then when we got to the masjid, and it came for the time for Salat al-Maghrib, he came up to me. He was probably close to 30 years of age. And he said to me, brother, I forgot how to read my namaz. I said, don't worry. We'll give you a brother. A brother will sit with you and he'll get the book of laws of Salah and he'll read and you can read the Arabic there. And he opened the book and he said, I forgot how to read it. I forgot how to read my namaz. I forgot how to read my Arabic. You know, we may be here sitting in this room thinking that everybody can read the namaz. Everybody can read the Quran. Everybody can. But we are living in a bubble. And so this person needed our help. And in the same way, we need to help these people that are struggling. Because these people are affected by peer pressure. Our youngsters are affected by peer pressure. Our schools, colleges are affected by peer pressure. But we, as elders especially, need to put pride inside our children. Our children need to be strong enough, proud of being a Muslim. At the moment, many of our children, they're afraid, they're ashamed of saying that I'm a Muslim. You know? So when they sneak off, sneak off to read the namaz in the school or college, or sneak off to read the namaz when they're at work. And when they come back and the colleagues say, where were you? Oh, I just had a few phone calls to make. Why didn't you say I went to read my namaz? Why are you so embarrassed about telling people that you're going to go and read namaz? We need to put that pride inside our children. They need to be proud of who they are. Because that child, in the same way that that young Khalid was, in, was encouraged to have that cigarette, he needs to be strong enough that says, no, my mother says don't take cigarettes. They need to have the courage when they're invited to nightclubs. They need to have that courage when they're invited to drink alcohol. They need to have that courage when they're invited to a girlfriend or a place where girls are going to be to say, no, I'm a Muslim, I do not do that. That is our job. And it's not only our job to put it in the youngsters, but it's also our job to be strong enough to push away these whispers of shaitan because we get affected by it as well. We just think that our youngsters are affected by peer pressure, but we're also affected as well. So we need to be strong enough. We need to be aware of this situation. And we should also be aware of the fact that Alhamdulillah, many of the people that are here today, you've come here with an Islamic mindset. But maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I've led a, such a bad life. I've led such a bad life, I've got no chance. You know, I'm just coming to the masjid because 
of my mates are there. Yeah? And I, I've led such a bad life. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a beautiful example. It's in Sai Muslim, this hadith. He said a person's in the middle of the desert. And he's got his camel with him with all the provisions on. The camel disappears. And when the camel disappears, he panics. Because that camel is his lifeline. That camel has his water. That camel has his provisions. And now he's panicking. So he climbs up to the highest sand dune. And he's looking. He can't see his camel. Now he gets tired, it's the blazing middle of the day, he's, the heat's there. He lies down, gets a bit of rest, gets bits of his energy back. But every second that he's lying down to get his energy back, in the back of his mind he's thinking to himself, this camel's getting further and further away. So he gets up, regains a bit of his strength, starts to look for the camel again. And now he's starting to really panic because if he can't find this camel, the camel could be miles away by now. He's got no chance of surviving in the middle of the desert. The Prophet of Allah said that at that moment, whilst he's lying down, waiting for the angel of death to come to him, he opens his eyes and he sees his camel. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that person is happy, but Allah Azza wa is more happy with his bondsmen when they repent from the sins that they have committed. When you repent from the sins that you have committed, Allah Azza wa is more happy. And so we should make a habit of repenting from our sins. How many of us, nobody here can say I never sinned. Nobody can say here say I've never made a mistake. And we also should not give up on each other. You might think to yourself, well why should I call him to the masjid? Today you've called people to the masjid. You've called people, in majority you've called people that you know. How many of us have actually gone out and phone those people that are so far away from the deen in the off chance that maybe, just maybe they might come. Or are we just going for the easy fish, so to speak? Those people that we meet at Jummah, those people that we meet in the Ishtama and say, oh, you know, Halabai, there's an Ishtama there, are you coming there? Are them the people that we invited? In Scotland, true story, this probably about maybe 10, 15 years ago, a person was the known alcoholic in this particular city. Everybody knew he was a Muslim, he was known that he used to drink alcohol. And people kept on inviting them to masjid. People kept on saying, stop drinking. People kept saying, and he didn't listen to anybody. But one day on the day of Friday, someone said to him that, look, it's Friday today. Uh, come on, come to the masjid. And he said, you know what? Okay, I'll come with you today. But I need to go home, I need to get a shower, I need to get changed, and then I'll be there. Now this Mubalik thought, you know what? Once he's gone, he's gone. <laughs> I'm not going to stay with him, yeah? So he said, come on, I'll take you home. I'll go with you to the house. So he goes to his house, he goes and has a shower, he puts on these clean clothes, he gets ready to go to the masjid, he comes to the masjid, he puts one foot inside the masjid, he has the heart attack and dies. Now death is written. But if that person had given up and thought to himself, you know what, too far gone. Yeah. He can never repent, he can never save himself. Maybe, just maybe that person's death would not have been the same. So we should never give up on people. We should never think to people that they're so far away from the deen that they can never change. Everybody can change. Have we not changed? How many of us are here sitting here today? We were not born into the environment of Dawud Islami. And if we look at our past, we look at where we come from. Allah Azawajal has given us the tawfiq, the ability to be here today. We are the lucky ones and we should thank Allah Azawajal that we are here today. As we heard the fireworks going off, there's many people that are not here today. For every one Muslim that's inside this masjid today, there's probably a thousand that are not. And you know that. And what are them thousand doing right now? Are they reading the Qur'an? Are they doing the zikr? Are they doing ibadat? No. I'm not saying all of them will be committing sins. But a good percentage of them will be. A good percentage of them will be on the town, will be going to places that they shouldn't be, doing things that they shouldn't be, and committing all sorts of sins. But we, we need to change. We need to change before it's too late. Our lives are very short. And we need to make an intention today. You know what they say? Make intentions at the end of the year. We need to make an intention today. Make good intentions today, that from now on, I'm never going to miss my namaz. From now on, when the month of Ramadan comes, I'm going to make sure I fast the whole month of Ramadan. From now on, when the month of Ramadan comes, I'm going to pray my taraweeh. From now on today, if you hear the brothers that are here today, if you are financially and physically careful and hajj is farz upon you and you've not performed the hajj, I request you, I beg you to make an intention to perform the hajj. And we need to become aware of those things. How precious is our iman? How valuable is our iman? If I was to say to you, value your Iman, is your Iman more valuable than your car? Is your Iman more valuable than your house? Yes, without doubt it is. Iman is the most valuable thing that you've got. But we don't do anything to protect it. We don't do anything to protect it. When I came here, I parked my car. I locked it. When I left my home, I locked the front door. You did the same. Why? Because you didn't want anyone stealing your car. You didn't want anyone breaking into your house. But who steals your car? Who breaks into your house? A man. A human being. Shaitan is far more cunning. And if you try to protect your car by putting a lock on it, Shaitan will do everything to take your Iman away. So you need to do everything to protect your Iman. 
And you need to come to these gatherings. You need to come to these tamas and become aware of those things that you can cause you to have a bad end. And I'm quickly just going to mention two things. A person who is disobedient to his parents, he runs the risk of dying without his iman. A person who is lazy in his salah, he runs the risk of dying without his iman. And just a third one. A person who harms the feelings of a fellow Muslim, he runs the risk of dying without his iman. Now I want you to ponder, I want you to think, and be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. You know the people that invited you here today, we were talking earlier on about the friends, the peer pressure, the people that invited you to here, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you here today, I can make this statement here, that none of these people are on a commission. They're not getting a commission, that I call 10 people, I will get this amount of money, I will get this, none of them are on a commission. Ha, ah, yes. In the court of Allah, Azawajal, inshaAllah, Azawajal, they'll be rewarded. So that is the commission that they are on. And that commission, that offer of making that commission is open to everybody. It's not just restricted to people that have an Imam Ashraf or restricted to those people that have a beard or restricted to people that wear the Jubba. No, it's an open offer. Everybody can get that reward. And we should all try and do this. We should all try and rectify each other because that is the mission statement of Dawud Islami. That I must strive to rectify myself and rectify the people of the whole world. That's our mission statement. And that should be your mission statement. You try and rectify yourself, try and sort yourself out, and try and sort out others as well. It is a constant battle to rectify. You can never say to yourself, anybody, I'm rectified, I'm sorted. Nobody here can say, I've got a certificate for paradise. It doesn't exist. We need to do everything to protect our Iman. You may watch Mother Channel, I pray that you all do. But Amir al many, many times, he says, the war against Shaitan will continue. Shaitan ke khalaf jang, jari rega. What is this war? What is this war? Is this war where when you leave this room, I give you all a baseball bat? And we go into the main room and say, okay, come on, let's sort you out. No, this is not the war. This war is your personal war. This war is your personal one. I'm looking around for the timetable here, for the Fajr timetable. I cannot see the time. I think it's probably 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. 7.30, that's your first battle. That's your time for your first battle. You're given an advanced warning that your first battle tomorrow morning will take place at 7.30. Now, it's up to you whether you're going to turn up at the battle or not. It's up to you whether you're going to win the battle or not. It's up to you whether you're going to lose the battle or not. This is purely your choice. You know, there's a saying in English, you can take a person to a horse to water, but you cannot force them to drink it. The masjid is open for you. The facilities are open for you. Everything's here for you. It's up to you whether you come here and take the blessings. But remember this, if you do not perform your Salat al-Fajr tomorrow, there's only one person that's going to be happy. Shaitan. It's up to you. The choice is yours. Tomorrow morning at Fajr, do you want to play Shaitan? Or do you want you to please your Rabb? And as Muslims, we need to live our lives in such a way that our aim in our life should be to please our Rabb. Whatever we do, whatever you do in your life, please your Rabb. Now, nowadays, you see on social media, you see on the internet nowadays that people are creating bucket lists. And a bucket list is something that when you create it, you make a list of all these things that you want to do in your life. I want to get a sports car. I want to get a semi-detached house. I want to get married when I'm 21. I want to become a millionaire when I'm 30. I want to retire when I'm 35. And you make all these things on this. Some of them are impossible. And you might think, I want to drive this car. I want to own this car. And you make all of these lists. And as you do them, you tick them off. And what you do is you put the most important things that you want to achieve in your life at the top of the list. All of you are here today. How many of us on our bucket list do we have? Please, my Rabb. Is it even on the list to please my Rabb? It should be the top of the list. Please my Rabb. That should be our aim in our life, to please our Rabb. And we need to work to do that. We need to protect our Iman. So I pray to Allah, that Allah, forgive me if I've said anything wrong, but Allah, also give me and you the tawfiq and the ability to think about what I've said. Think about what I've said. Make that change in your life before it's too late. Come to the masjid before people carry you to the masjid. Live your life in such a way that when you pass away and people will talk about you, they talk about you in such a way that Jannah is wajib upon you. If you pass away and people speak ill about you, then hell is wajib for you. You need to live your life in such a way. Prepare yourself because there's no guarantees. I don't know what time I'm going to have go home today. I don't even know if there's langar here today. I don't know if there's anything here today. But one thing I know that is a guarantee in my life is that I'm going to die. That's the only guarantee that we have. And all our lives are running around for many, many other things. But we're all running around for the one thing that we have a guarantee in our life. We're living in this dunya, we're chasing this dunya. Remember this, that a person that runs after dunya, he never gets it. A person that loves money is always poor because he always thinks I've not got enough. So stop chasing the dunya and chase the akhirat. And that's where we need to make a change. 
run after the akhirat and the dunya will come after you sallu ala al habib sallallahu ta'ala ala muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam